All right, welcome everyone. Uh, the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio, uh, Talk Back Edition. And of course, John King's over there, Bob Seiden Schwartz joining us. We have a special guest waiting on Oh, uh, we certainly do. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Barnett on the phone. Uh, Tom's going to be one of our uh, primary speakers at the Energy Conference, which starts next week on the 29th and 30th. So I'd like to welcome Tom to Missoula. Uh, we have a brief hour with him here today, so we'll yes. dispense of the uh, general niceties and let's get to the heart of the subject because this is a fascinating individual with a background to uh, match. So, Peter, if you would just give us a brief introduction and introduce our guest, and let's get into it, folks. Real quick, he's an American military geostrategist and chief analyst at Wikistrat. He developed a geopolitical theory that divided the world into the functioning core and the non-integrating gap that made it particularly notable prior to the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq when he wrote an article for Esquire magazine in support of the military action entitled The Pentagon's New Map which would later become the title of a book that would elaborate on his geopolitical theories. The central thesis of his geopolitical theory is that the connections that globalization brings between the countries, including network connectivity, financial transactions, and media flows, are synonymous with uh, those countries with stable governments, rising standards of living, and more deaths by suicide than by murder. Uh, those countries uh, form the functioning core. These regions contrast with those where globalization is not yet penetrated, which is synonymous with political repression, poverty, disease, and mass murder and conflict. These areas make up the non-integrating gap. And now that we've got your appetites whetted, Mr. Barnett, thanks for joining us here on TalkBack this morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, Tom, let's, uh, let's get right to the heart of this. I mean, we've had many discussions on this show about the effects of globalization in terms of both what happens right here in Montana, the U.S., and, of course, the world. So can you please give us the kind of where did you develop this school of thinking in terms of how did it bring you to this point? Because obviously there's an evolution in terms of where you started, reading a little bit about your background. At one time, uh, you looked at Russia and the U.S. as continuing to be the two primary powers, and, of course, that changed. So just give us a little evolution of your thinking and background and bring us to the current state. Well, the, the whole concept of the Pentagon's new map or the, or the way of looking at the world in terms of where globalization has spread and found deep connectivity versus where it's being resisted or curtailed, that began as work for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps looking at all the places they had been going around the world in the 80s and 90s. This was back in the early 90s, post-Cold War, Navy and Marine Corps are trying to find new justifications for their existence because the Soviets are gone. And what we found was they are busy doing all these crisis responses around the world. Uh, ultimately, that work expanded into covering the Air Force and the Army. And what I noticed was there was an equatorially centric pattern if you added up all the different interventions over time, and there's somewhere in the range of 150, 160 now, uh, named operations ordered by the President of the United States where one or more of the services were involved for a length of time, um, they tend to be concentrated along the equator, and I was able to draw a line, basically, around 95% of them, and it, it captured you know, the Caribbean... Central America, the northern Andes portion of South America, virtually all of Africa, into the Balkans, into Central Asia, wraps around uh, India and encompasses, at that point, a big chunk of Southeast Asia. And that, that area there, uh, which I called the non-integrated gap, was basically 95% of U.S. military responses post-Cold War. And the assumption or the, uh, the, the theory was, and still is, that that's the natural demand pattern from the world when you take out the superpower rivalry. Those are the parts of the world that need an intervening uh, power to come in and help stabilize what are essentially civil strife situations. The state-on-state -state war of the previous century basically has gone the way of the dinosaur. We don't have state-on-state -state war. What we have our state-based conflicts, basically a government having war with individuals or groups inside its country or in a neighboring country, or interventions by great powers into those situations. So that notion of drawing that map and saying, hey, this is your natural market here, it was you know, a hard sell prior to 
because the Bush administration came in with their sights on China and Russia and sort of focusing on the big pieces. 9-11 was a revolution in itself. It brought back the notion of um, nation building, having to fix countries. Uh, we went into that process rather vigorously. Iraq and Afghanistan got tired of it, as we have in the past, just as we were getting good, uh, as we have in the past. Um, and as befits a democracy, you know, after seven years of being worn out by George Bush, we elected twice uh, an individual for president um, who promised a very different path. And that has been kind of more the retrenchment from Southwest Asia, less involvement, leading from behind, uh, and the so-called pivot to East Asia to focus again on China, because if you leave Southwest Asia, and you don't want to be accused of not being strong on defense as a Democrat, you have to go somewhere. And so we're defaulting back to that original pre-9-11 George Bush focus on China, and now we have Russia back in the mix thanks to the Ukraine. And we're back at that point again in the U.S. national security establishment where the debate is, is once again, are we going to be about big wars, the potential for big wars against big players like China and India, or is the reality that the demand out there for U.S. military services is still the Libyas, the Syrias, the Yemens, all these situations that don't go away, where the actual warfare is happening. Um, and that's, you know, that's an ongoing debate, not easily solved in one direction or the other. Are we about preventing the big war and preparing for the big war, or should we embrace the reality that it's a messy world and we're stuck managing a lot of post-colonial situations that the Europeans left us from 100, 150 years ago? And which side of the dime does uh, Mr. Barnett land on? Well, I've always been about, uh, on the basis of, of making that argument that where globalization deeply penetrates, you move past the possibility of war, especially when we're talking great powers that all have nuclear weapons. So we know in a crystal ball effect dynamic what great power war would look like. Eventually, somebody pulls the trigger on nukes. That hasn't changed. And, I mean, there's a reason why we haven't had a conventional great power on great power war since 1945, and that is nuclear weapons. Okay, so that hasn't changed. In my mind, uh, repositioning Russia as a threat when it's 2% of the world's population and 2% of the global GDP, it's just not a credible long-term situation. We could talk about the expansion of NATO versus Russia biting back tiny bits of of Georgia and substantial bits of Ukraine. I mean, that trade is pretty good. We got Poland, the Czech Republic. Uh, <laughs> it's like know. we're trading baseball cards here. I'll give you two right, Lithuanias yeah. and yeah, an Estonia a for the Ukraine. global economy there, and they're stuck uh, fighting over little shares right. of the old Soviet Union. Okay, Tom, Tom, so, no, I don't. I don't jump into the camp of Russia, U.S. back to a Cold War, especially when the U.S. is moving you know, with this fracking revolution towards genuine energy independence, um, that gives us the possibility of moving a lot of product, refined and crude, even to Europe over time. That makes Europe less dependent on Russia. That means Russia, as the world's largest exporter of natural resources, it's got to sell to somebody, okay. and that somebody is China, and China is a hell of a country to do business with. They're Tom, very tough on hey, price hey, and hey, performance. I, I got, I got, so, to ju- I got to jump in here for just a second because we're we're up sure. against a commercial break, and so I'm going to I'll be I'll be the rude guy doing that. So please forgive me. We're going to come right back. If you have a question or a comment for Tom Barnett, phone lines are open. We only have them for an hour. So seven two one twelve ninety. Go ahead, John. Oh no? yeah, we'll, we'll be right back with more of Talk Back right after this. Hey, we're back on TalkBack, 721-1290 is the number. I'm Peter Christian, John King, Bob Seidenschwartz joining us here in studio. And, of course, we've got Tom Barnett on the phone. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Tom wanted to uh, touch on China, but I'd like to ask him a question about, uh, in regards to what we were talking about off air in terms of kind of the military, in effect, had been used to fighting these large, massive type of conflicts. It was built on that basis for equipment, procurement, and funding. So this starts to go away when Russia leaves, in effect. And the military is looking for a new role. You've got the political issues. So how much of this also really goes to that point, Tom, that military was kind of, in effect, looking for a, I hate to use the word rationalization for existence, but 
what it had done previously and what it may be facing in the future had pretty substantial implications on a number of different levels. Sure. I mean, the reason why the post-war experience in Iraq and Afghanistan was difficult was, for example, and you remember the, uh, the armoring of Humvees question. Right. I mean, this was huge for a long time. Well, the Army for years refused across the 90s to armor their Humvees or consider it because they said, you know, we're not going to be doing that kind of stuff. We're going to be racing to Baghdad. We're not going to be concerned with the post-war. We're going to be doing big crisis response, big crises against big players. So the idea of, of hanging around and needing armor on Humvees to protect people on a daily basis, that was just rejected. We weren't going to be that kind of military. It was a bit of a, a, a falsehood for them to turn around and accuse uh, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense under George W. Bush, of being the big holdup in that. You know, the Army itself had for years resisted that model, as had the Navy and the Air Force. They were going to be about big wars, big players. Uh, and if they had to do the small ones, they, what they called the lesser included, well, they were just going to blow through small opponents and then leave. There was your uh, Powell doctrine. I go, I conquer, I leave. If I have to come back and do it all over again, fine, but I don't own the process. Well, Colin Powell, once he becomes Secretary of State, uh, switches his tune, as it so often happens when you cross the Potomac, um, and he comes up with the Pardery Bond rule. If you break it, you own it. <laughs> that was sort of the shift that we experienced after Iraq. We got serious with it, the whole counterinsurgency movement, um, and then we got tired of it, as we so often do. We got tired of the whole process of doing similar things in Vietnam, uh, and walked away from that capability for about 20 years. We got it back for Iraq and Afghanistan, just started getting good. And then, you know, we get tired, and the Air Force and the Navy feeling shorted by the experience in terms of budget and focus. You know, they come back with a vengeance saying, hey, check out China, check out Russia. We need to be buying big platforms. We need to be preparing for the high-tech wars of tomorrow. And, you know, my argument is, a lot of this stuff is just never going to happen. It's not feasible, some of these scenarios that were drawn up with China, you know, extended wars where we're sinking their ships and such, when in reality these ships tend to come to the United States in terms of products and goods. Um, we need to be more realistic about the world as we find it. And ultimately, you know, you can't keep looking at your ally pool as being the Brits, the French, and maybe a few others. In reality, the two players that are rising in the system with million-man armies, extensive resource dependencies around the world, and thus are incentivized to fight and protect to keep the system whole, that's India and China. Those are the two big players. I mean, you can look 2030, 2035, and it is a, a world dominated by China, India, and America. So, Tom, yet, can, can we... We uh, still think of the Europeans as our only allies. We've got a caller that would like to speak to you for a minute, but then I'd like to come back to something that doesn't get discussed very often. Everybody's talking about China, but India has been right. quietly becoming and will become economically and possibly militarily even more of a player in China. So once we get to our call, yeah. I'd like to come back to that question. And not just with, sure. Bo not just with Bollywood either. Let's get to <laughs> right. Catherine, you're on with Tom Barnett. Go ahead. A few weeks back, um, 44 million people in Turkey lost power through the distribution system, and indications are that Iran was behind that. So two questions. Would you include Iran in the Great Player Club? along with China, Russia, and India. And uh, where do you put cyber warfare uh, in the mix of types of war? Uh, would you think that that perhaps is a continuing warfare? I mean, it's going to be a continuous thing. It's not with no resolution. Thanks, right. Catherine. Um, again, I look at a, what I call a CIA future, China, India, America. Uh, I don't put Russia in that same pool. I think Russia, as it gets isolated from the West over the Ukraine and these kinds of activities, it has one choice, to sell itself out over time to the Chinese. So it becomes sort of a natural resource vassal state to China. So I don't put Russia in that category. In the second tier great power category, yeah, Iran is big. Uh, Turkey Saudi Arabia, Iran, those are the three key players in the Middle East. That is a three-sided rivalry. Um, they are duking it out in Syria and Iraq. You know, 
the Turks and the Saudis have in many ways enabled the rise of ISIS because they preferred a Sunni-based insurgency to kind of break up Iran's growing control. You know, it has strong influence in Baghdad, in Damascus, Syria, in Beirut, Lebanon, and now in Sana'a, Yemen. Well, if you're the, the Saudi royal family, that starts to look like an encirclement over time by the Iranians who are uh, moving towards, have achieved basically a breakout nuclear capability that they're going to get codified with the West that basically says if they have to, they could come up with a bomb in, in 10 to 12 months. So that makes Iran a potent player that's seeking in some ways regional dominancy in the Persian Gulf. Why America less interested in managing the Middle East? Why America now becoming more energy independent, more interested in focusing on China? The big buyers of Persian Gulf energy are China, India, South Korea, Japan, none of those countries are willing to step in and play the extra-regional Leviathan role that the U.S. has played going back to the early 70s. That creates a bit of a vacuum feeling, and that's why this three-sided rivalry between Iran, Turkey, and the Saudis is now going to get very interested, okay. uh, interesting and right. possibly move into a nuclear realm, certainly Yikes. cyber in the absence of of an open acceptance of a nuclear reality of one or more players. Okay. And, nukes. and Iran could get a nuke. The Saudis can always get a nuke from Pakistan. Uh, right, cyber we'll... becomes a big component along with proxy warfare through uh, parties in okay. third states. Tom, like we're, up, we're, up, we're up against a break, Tom. Now between Saudi-backed yeah. and Iranian-backed okay. players. Okay, Tom, we're up against a break. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're, we're gonna. This is so fascinating. I have to take a commercial break. We'll come right back. Go ahead, John. Oh, so stay with us. We have two lines open. Seven two one twelve ninety. And we're back on Talk Back, and we have. This is a very short segment, so I know we want to introduce a new topic, so we can uh, expand on it in the nine o'clock hour. So Tom Barnett's joining us. We have a, a little bit of a game changer thing here, Bob. Right. Right. Uh, there's no question. There's a game changer, and that is U.S. and North American energy independence. So, Tom, would you please elaborate a little bit on what is the dynamic of this, and how do you then see this changing some of the other areas in terms of production, geopolitical? In two minutes. Right. Um, if you look back, the U.S. right up to World War II was predominantly coal-based. Then we switched over to oil. That was the big transformation wrought by the Second World War. When it became that dominant fuel, we became more interested in the Middle East, and when the Middle East started to come apart in the early 70s with the wars, uh, that's when it started to assume a central position in U.S. strategic response patterns. So that's where we were going constantly to do stuff. Well, you look ahead, 2030 roughly, and we're talking about the U.S. shifting from oil based as the predominant fuel in the mix to natural gas. And you've got to believe that's going to change the way we look at Southwest Asia. I said it before, China, India, South Korea, Japan, none of them are ready to step in. That means there's a bit of a vacuum there, but it does give us a much more secure position from which to choose our interventions around the world. Europe, similar, within 2030, they're looking at becoming predominantly renewable energy as their primary source. So the two big players that have really worried about and exercised control over the Persian Gulf for the benefit of the world economy they're going away in terms of their incentive structure for making that kind of effort, and it's not clear who's going to step into that. To me, that's a huge game changer in terms of crisis and perceptions of stability of international energy markets. And it's all wrought by the innovation and the free rule sets in America that allowed that whole fracking revolution to experiment and come to fruition. All right. So with that, the thank you so much. That was very well done, and right on time. So, Tom, thank you. Tom Barnett's going to stay with us and for another half an hour from, until 9.30. So if you have a question or a comment, give us a call at 721-1290, 1-800-568-5309. You're also welcome to make your comments on our Facebook page. Just go to Facebook, KGVO, and uh, we'll get your, your, your question answered. With Tom Barnett, Bob Seidenschwartz, Peter Christian, of course, Talk Back continues the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. We're having a bang-up time here talking uh, with uh, Tom Barnett. This is Montana World Affairs Council. Ready? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I have a question. We were speaking earlier about energy and the switch. Uh, the U.S. made the switch from coal to oil. Uh, basically, he was arguing earlier. I want to know, do you predict a disruptive technology switch in the near future? 
for the United States, or is oil going to be king for a while? Well, oil is going to be important for the system as a whole because of the amazing expansion of demand arising from the growth of a global middle class that's appearing largely in terms of dynamics in Asia. So as much as China tries to embrace uh, renewables, as much as China goes after its own shale uh, gas reserves, which are the largest in the world but geologically hard to access, as much as they go for nukes anything, they're still going to have to use a great deal of coal, a great deal of oil, just because the volume, the increase, is so dramatic. The good news there is most of that demand growth comes and goes by about 2035. So the, the peak oil, we're running out of resources arguments. By and large, we're moving past that, and we're starting to understand that what we're embracing here is not just a move down the hydrocarbon chain from coal to oil to natural gas, which is good for the environment. Uh, and by the way, we can take the clean coal that we have here in America that's being displaced by natural gas in electricity generation and ship it to India and China to improve their coal use because their coal tends to be pretty dirty compared to ours. Um, we are moving into a larger understanding, processing all that new demand, um, that there are tremendous opportunities and tremendous requirements as you get a global middle class that's about 60% of the world's population, the resource utilization models that the West had, highly inefficient, have to be dramatically altered. Great example. My friend uh, Amory Lovins at uh, Rocky Mountain Institute talks about, until very recently, the amount of energy that a car used, roughly 1% of it made it go forward. And the rest was kind of lost in inefficiency and just making the car active. So you look at that and you say, can I get a better response utilization than 1% of my oil use translates wow. into forward motion? Wow. Yes. So it's the understanding of the difference between standard of living and consumption pattern. This growing middle class that everybody kind of fears on a resource constraint basis, they want a standard of living. They want to go forward. Can we do it at a better rate than 1% utilization of oil? Absolutely. So the breakthrough technologies are coming in all directions um, in terms of lighter cars, moving to hybrids, ultimately moving to natural gas, which you're starting to see in cabs, uh, and ultimately I think you're going to see in the next 10 years in long-haul trucking in the United States because you can set up that infrastructure right on interstates. You don't need that many stations. All these things are going to allow the world to consume a lot more um, or, or no, to achieve a better standard of living while not consuming at the old Western rates. Mm. Uh, so a resource utilization revolution coming on the heels of this expanding global middle class, technological breakthroughs across the board, you know, almost too many to name, but one we like to talk about a lot, and Wikistrat ran a simulation on this, the future of it, uh, 3D printing, that's a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, and fascinating on almost too many levels to count. Mm. So, Tom, I... You know, for these things to happen, there's still pushback. So recently there was an article came putting it in its proper perspective from Earth Day celebration saying ban fracking. So you were talking to us off air about the implications of the U.S. and making some very interesting insights about the administration and its policies. For us to be able to affect these changes, it would not happen if this energy revolution was not occurring. So if we were to ban fracking as some would like. There's tremendous implications also to the downside. So could you kind of, you know, pick up where we were starting to have that conversation off air? And keep, keep in mind, we have, a, we have two minutes before a break, so go ahead. Right. Um, it all comes down to rules, and that's my whole theory of globalization. It extends itself, and it brings rules. Globalization comes with rules, not a ruler, okay? The rule set that America enjoys that says you own what's under your ground as a private individual that is a rare rule set, almost like our religious freedom. It does not exist in the rest of the world. The government tends to own what's under the ground. So the fact that we had that kind of entrepreneurial openness to exploring the fracking, um, that's just a huge advantage that shows time and again we have a superior economic and political system. But our rules tend to come in response to disasters and mistakes. And so we are in the midst now of seeing a correction from the early abuses of the whole fracking opportunity, 
um, which, you know, people went overboard, people weren't careful enough, mistakes were made, all sorts of problems ensue. Those are being cleaned up now in an environmental pushback. As long as that's calibrated so that you can still get the production while protecting the environment, then I think it's a win-win, and it's something that we're able to export technologically around the world to the betterment of the entire planet. Okay, we're, but up with that, we're going to take a little break. 721-1290, 1-800-568-5309. We'd love to have your calls. I'm just sitting here fascinated. I don't need to say a word. This is great. <laughs> we're going to come right back with more of Talk Back right after this. It's Talk Back, 721-1290 is the number. John King's over there. Bob Seidenschwartz joining us. It's the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. I wanted to uh, do a little brain game uh, with Dr. Kaplan, kind of connect the dots. Uh, we had uh, earlier... I'm sorry. I did say Kaplan, didn't you I? Did. I you did. That's because I was looking at that article from earlier. I apologize because you guys are kind of diametrically opposed. Uh, Dr. Barnett, uh, one of the things we were talking about is energy and fracking, and Montana's role in that is huge. But uh, you were kind of connecting the dots earlier at the top of the hour with Cuba and the recent negotiations going on between the White House and Cuba. And I was hoping you could kind of do that for our audience. Show us how these two things are connected. Well, uh, think about who's been the most active player in Central America and the biggest backer of Cuba for the last 15 to 20 years. That was Hugo Chavez out of Venezuela, who talked a very anti-American game and yet was basically the third largest supplier of crude oil to the United States. Why? Logistics. It was the best price he could get in terms of how far he had to transport it. Well, Chavez runs that system basically into the ground. The U.S. fracking comes along, pressures the price point downward, and all of a sudden a Venezuela that was, an, you know, this oil state that was the new power like a Russia that everybody was talking about in the 2000s, they're going to dominate the system. All of a sudden they're incredibly vulnerable. Because Venezuela can't fund and bolster and send all sorts of aid to Cuba, that puts the Castro brothers in a totally different frame of mind. That leads to the opportunity we're now exploring, which is normalization of relations with Cuba. You can track that causal chain all the way back to the fracking revolution. You don't have that. Venezuela is still strong. Cuba is still obstinate. And we get nowhere in that process. Because of it, you know, what is being interpreted as kind of a weak move by Obama is actually reflective of a newfound strength and confidence and assurance in American foreign policy that we got to get used to, which is, you know, we get to pick and choose with less fear um, where we intervene, what we engage with, who we can manage relationships with more openly, like Iran, like Cuba, because... We are in this position of power now. We're much more resource independent. And the players who have been giving us the most trouble, the, the, you know, the oil autocracies, you could call them, of the last 15 to 20 years, they're in a much weaker position like a Russia, Venezuela, and Iran. Will this normalization pull Cuba out of what you call the gap? Well, absolutely. I mean, there are, you know, my prediction has been for a while now, once you open this process up, and we're seeing the vestige of this kind of resistance from Rubio, the presidential candidate on the Republican side. I mean, there are so many Miami Cubans who've got so many suitcases you know, filled with cash ready to go back there. That place will become very much integrated into the U.S. economy very quickly. And within five to ten years, what used to be the Cuban demand in the election cycle, presidential election cycle, you don't get Florida unless you're against uh, lifting the Cuban embargo, that could radically shift to you don't get uh, Florida electoral votes unless you're for much deeper integration with the Cuba uh, Cuban people and ultimately the possibility of statehood. So, Tom, I've got to ask you this question. I've been advocating that the fracking revolution is a political game changer based on this examples and conversation. What I need to know is within the administration, within the Senate, within the Congress, has this been embraced in terms of their recognition and ability yeah. to use this? And if not, when in the heck are they going to wake up to this? Because it seems very intuitive to many of us. I need to know our leadership understands this. And the answer is no. They don't understand it. And I mean, you could see it in Rubio's response to Obama. You can see it in the overwrought angst that is coming from the right and some from the left uh, in terms of uh, his outreach, Obama's outreach to Iran. 
they see all these things as moves of weakness. Um, they don't understand what the newfound strength is. Um, ultimately, Obama is sort of like a, uh, you know, n- not negatively so much a Carter figure. He's an adjustment, a bottoming out of a loss of confidence that we had, like with Carter, after the whole Vietnam experience. But Carter put us on the move in many ways, started the defense buildup, did things that led and enabled Reagan to come in and do his thing. I think uh, historically Obama plays a similar role. And the question becomes, who comes in to really, in 2016, understands that that confidence uh, as, it, as it emerges from this uh, fracking revolution and starts to implement it more openly with better explanations. Obama doesn't explain his moves terribly well. Uh, and then that person is you know, kind of the Reagan player that opens things up and puts us on the path to a more normalized relationship with a lot of big powers and troublesome powers around the world. Um, can that be a Clinton? Can that be another Bush? Well, I think those are the two main choices for now. I think either of them could do it. I think the system in many ways is going to demand it. So your solution is coming, but it's not here yet. I hope you, you get to open up the presidential library for Obama. You get to say, <laughs> I don't want you to take this negatively, but I see you as the bottoming out. Yeah, uh, yeah. That would be an interesting speech. Yeah, now, now, Tom, well, I, 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 if, if I may ask a quick question here. We had a story that cleared the AP Newswire this morning that there are several states that are appealing to a governmental uh, uh, a panel about the uh, amount of earthquakes that are going on in, in states that primarily depend on fracking to mm-hmm. uh, get their oil. And so I'm wondering, is, is, is future technology going to be able to uh, focus in on that? Because a lot of folks are really worried that, uh, that the increasing of earthquake activity and the fouling mm-hmm. of water and, and of, of aquifers may, uh, may doom the fracking movement before it really begins to you know, take over. Right. My company, Wikistrat, which is the world's first crowdsourced consultancy, we have about 2,000 experts around the world. We bring them together online for these vast um, uh, crowdsourced simulations of the future. About three, four years ago, we looked at the North American export energy boom, uh, and one of the scenarios we had was, you know, uh, two big questions. Does America get the fracking revolution right or wrong? I mean, does it get it wrong with the technology? Does it get it wrong with the behavior of the industry? Does it create such a backlash from the political system and the environmental system that it ultimately gets curtailed and we don't get to take advantage of it? And then the other question we asked was, could the world copy the U.S. system well, or would it ultimately walk away from it? Right now, you know, I would say we're on the side of doing it right. There is a natural reaction. I talked about that overreach with the technology and the environmental abuse. That happens in every industry that we ever pursue, and it happens consistently in the energy industry. You know, you need a certain backlash to unfold in the court system and legislatively to correct any abuses and regain the confidence of that segment of your population and then let that become the new normal that the political and the national security system begins to understand and, and take advantage of over time. Okay, I'm okay. optimistic that you know, the rules and the re- reactions that are coming are, are valid and, and there are technological answers for it. I mean, they didn't do that kind of sealing of the pipes going down that they do now to prevent the leakage into the aquifers. I mean, they just they did it the simplest, cheapest way they could early on until they got negative results and then blowback from the public and then force and threats from the government to clean up their act or they'd clean it up for them. Right. That's all positive. Um, you know, you don't want to get too um, overboard on one uh, uh, perspective or the other. Not everything that fracking does is great. Yes, there need to be controls. But ultimately, I think the U.S. is working it out in, in a suitable fashion over time with the usual hiccups. Okay. Uh, and over time, we're going to be able to export that very strong environmental rule set on how to do fracking right to the benefit of the planet. Okay, we're going to take a little break. Seven two one twelve ninety. Tom Barnett, this is a fascinating conversation. I know John has questions, Bob has questions, and I'm sure you do as well. There goes the phone. Seven two one twelve ninety. Uh, we would love to have you involved. Now remember, Tom can only be with us for another 10 minutes. So if you want to have a question answered, get your call in right now to seven two one twelve ninety. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back. 
1290. This is this is a conversation I do not want to end because we're having way too much fun. Uh, Tom Barnett uh, talking with us this morning. Uh, he is in charge of Wikistrat and uh, fascinating conversation. So where were we before I so rudely interrupted? Well, we just got a couple of minutes here. So we yeah. were kind of talking about the political of who has the chops basically <laughs> to kind of lead uh, with some of the, you know, directive that uh, Tom has been discussing today, and he mentioned a couple of people. So, Tom, if you want to just give us in a brief minute or two uh, before we have to say goodbye. You've got about four minutes, so go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I attended a uh, Republican confab down at Disney World a couple of years back after the midterm, and we had a conversation about, uh, well, I guess it was after the, the election, the re-election of Obama in 2012, um, and we had a conversation looking ahead about where we thought the, um, the major candidates would come from. And, you know, Begala and Carvel, who were there, said right back then, there's Hillary and there's nobody else of any great stature in the Democrats, and there's Jeb Bush and really nobody else in terms of great stature in the Republicans. And we've seen both of them amass tremendous war chests, um, and they have that whole front-runner thing to deal with in many ways, and satisfying what is a strong left in the Democrats and a strong right in the Republicans. Ultimately, I'm confident um, that you're looking at two fairly mainstream candidates, more centrist than extreme. I think their political machinery is vast and profound in its power. I expect them to be the two nominees. There's always the possibility of an insurgent like Obama, but I think in this election cycle, that kind of insurgent can't really win. I, I got to throw this out there. Knows that we've gone through our healing period after Bush in the form of Obama. We feel more confident economically. We think there are strong things that need to be dealt with. We think there's a world that needs to be engaged more. And I think both uh, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, they're the kind of big mainstream, genuine politicians meaning they're not stuck on their belief systems. They will change their positions when the facts change. <laughs> Thank you for that definition. Yeah. But I, I think when you say that, the, your prediction of the future, everybody hears that and it gives a collective yawn. Towards this new confidence we've been discussing regarding energy security and ultimately find a better balance. So I'm fairly sanguine given what we're looking at as uh, front runners for now that, that we're going to get a good movement in the right direction Come 2016. All right, election night. Uh, it's uh, your final decision. You're the tiebreaker. It's Hillary versus Jeb. Who do you think would be better for the world? Hmm, that's tough. Uh, my heart tends to go Democratic. I tend to work for Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I see a centrist. So you know, and my wife's a real Democrat, and. I enjoy sex in the marriage, so I'll probably go Democratic. Oh, man. A man of integrity also, well, and I'm right go. there with you, bud. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> a, a, a little self-serving, but that's okay. That's, a, that's okay. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, Tom. Live once. <laughs> we're, we're, we're about to let you go, and I, I want folks to know how they can find out more about uh, about your works and the work that you do and your opinions and things. So how, how can they get in touch with you and uh, what you do? Well, me personally, they can get in touch at Thomas, P for Pat, M for Mike, Barnett.com, Thomas, P.M. Barnett.com, and then uh, Wikistrat, W-I-K-I-S-T-R-A-T.com. Uh, that's out there, um, tremendous amount of information that we put out, all sorts of simulations we're running all the time, looking at uh, all the hot spots, pretty much anything that you're talking about now, we did a simulation on two, three years ago. Um, and the kind of wisdom you can draw from that crowd. Uh, we really think it's the future of consulting, and our success with foreign governments, the U.S. government, U.S. military, indicates that it really is the way uh, strategic consulting is going to go. Well, we are really looking forward to having you here. What, Bob? Yeah, what we'll was? see you next week. Uh, again, Missoula, the 29th and 30th, uh, sponsored by the Mansfield Center, the Asian Montana Energy Summit, of which uh, Tom will be one of our featured speakers. Yeah, we've, so, asked, uh, we've asked everybody else to stay home, and so Tom can right. just... <laughs> so, Tom, I'll see you next week. Looking forward to it. Great. Looking forward myself. Okay, th take th care now. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Have a great day. And uh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, e e either either he's very hard of hearing, <laughs> or 
You know, it's just one of those deals. Where I think his brain is just so big. Well, it's just got so <laughs> there's just so much information he wants to share. But uh, hey, you two guys do a great job of just trying to keep it in. But uh, look, this is the, and I, I personally want to thank both of you and KGVO for making this available to the World Affairs Council because sure. we bring, I believe, great speakers, have great conversation, and. The feedback I get from Missoula is that they really enjoy it. So and thanks to you guys. Yeah, and since nobody else is doing it, we're thrilled to be the ones. Right. And, and we're, we're thrilled you chose us. Well, thank you guys. So yeah. I will see you next week because we got a couple of more guests uh, cool. that we'll be bringing to the table. So have a good day, and I'll see you next week. Thanks, right. Bob. Appreciate it. And we have another guest coming. That's right. It's going to be a fascinating discussion about the Veterans Administration in the state of Montana. First-hand account. Uh, Mr. Chris Polinus is in, a former veteran and, I guess, well, uh, yeah. current veteran. Yeah. Uh, also, he works <laughs> He works on both sides of the coin. He works right. for the VA, and he works, you know, they work for him. So should be an interesting discussion. Stay with us, and we'd love to have your phone calls. By the way, all three lines are open now. And when we get into this conversation, I'm sure that you will want to enter in. We'll be right back. All right, we're back on Talkback 721-1290. We are shifting gears, quite literally here. Uh, another guest in studio. We're going to talk about veterans affairs. And That's right. uh, so Go ahead, John. Yeah, Peter and I are going to get our butts handed to us by an ex-Marine. Uh, <laughs> Vietnam uh, veteran and uh, currently a little bit of a uh, tangle with the federal government, apparently, over this uh, potential move of the VA building. I was hoping that you could come on and kind of tell us some of the issues that vets are facing here in Missoula and what the veteran community is facing here in the state of Montana. You were telling me that uh, you've seen some paperwork, some studies that had been done on the VA clinics in Montana, and that they have dropped significantly in their rank. I was hoping you could kind Let of explain that to us. Let me speak to that a little bit. Sure. What this has Chris, happened Chris Polonis, the... by the way, in case you're wondering. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. Tease yeah. him in before the break. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what has happened in the last five or six years, we've had four or five different directors. When you lose leadership all of the time, the ranks get confused, and the morale really goes down. So that seems to be one of the biggest problems right now that the VA is facing. Do you want me to talk about the move up to the forestry? Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Uh, before that, be, I want you to talk about that. You were talking about how the ranking of, of Montana's VA system had dropped from, I think, one or two down to 120. Well, the reports are it dropped from one to 126 out of 128. No one can seem to find that information anymore. Now, now hold on a second. What? Uh, 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 when were we number one? At, at what point? Just a few years ago, we were at number one for... No, number one for what? Number um, one as far as a uh, VA health care right. center. Okay. In, in relationship to all the other uh, VA facilities in the United States. Well, not, not when, you, when you take into consideration the fact that I've heard these statistics before, that mm. per capita, Montana has more veterans than any other state, right? Correct. All right, so, so it, if that is true... And that, that's something to be very proud of, that at one point we were, you know, the number one as far as access and, and providing care to our veterans, who are very numerous here in Montana. What was it that caused that precipitous drop from, you know, being number one to where we are now? Well, wherever we are right now, and I don't know exactly, you know, for sure if those are the accurate stats, but... Um, w- like I was saying just a minute ago, we've had about five different directors in five or six years. When you keep changing leadership... Now, are we talking state directors or national directors? Uh, uh, state directors, okay. regional directors right. of our VA system. Okay. Once you have somebody in the helm in Helena and they only stay a year or two, everybody in the ranks, the people who work for VA Montana, try to follow his lead, her lead, and then what happens? She goes for whatever reason. He goes, and you, you start keep changing, scratch, right? yeah, leadership. So what happens after a while is the is the troops don't know who to follow, what to follow, how to follow, because the ideas like, change. It sounds, it sounds like a military organization without a proper <laughs> leader, right? Exactly. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> So, so anyway, so I, what, it's what happened ironic, was actually. the VA secretary from D.C. Yeah. came out here. Right. Bob McDonald. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, and I met him. And what he's doing is going around like they used to do in the military to have a battleground kind of circulation to find out what really is going on here and how do we change it. Hmm. So that's apparently what's going on right now. And we'll see if our new director, uh, Gannetti, will be able to 
rise up to the occasion and stay but, for a long period but, of time. But, but hasn't Johnny, it's a Johnny Gennetti or Gennetti, or however you pronounce yeah. his name, ha- hasn't he been in charge for a while, or was it like an interim director? He was an interim director, and now he is the full-time director. Okay. What I've heard is that he's been acting as a director, but... All in all, what happens with the troops or the people that work for VA Montana, the volunteers, even the veterans that get service there, is that you have to follow somebody's ideas, right. whether it's your health care or in, in war, whatever you have to do, you follow the, you know, the big general, right? And, uh, you know, that's been the problem is, you know, is he going to stay? Now he is going to stay. What's he going to do? How's he going to do it? Money's not going to be the answer. It's going to be leadership. And we need, you know, really strong leadership right now. I, I want to ask, what is the effect on the ground of all this management shifting? It's hard for people to relate to this stuff going on in Helena when, you know, you're looking for <laughs> care here in Missoula. So how is it negatively affecting the system as it works here in town, for example? Everything is generated out of Helena or how we would like to call them the kingdom. <laughs> so anything that that, they probably like that to be comes the down from there <laughs> yeah. is what everybody else that's in tangent to Helena has to uh, kind of follow their lead. So what happens is that there have certain directives, and all of a sudden they get changed or they're not working, and um, people get confused. So what happens is the morale goes down. A lot of our new providers are combat veterans. A lot of them are veterans here now, younger ones from the OIF, OEF, and Desert Storm situation. And they all still are young enough to really grab a hold of uh, operation and run with it. But if what happens is that the leadership changes, directives changes, you know, they get to the point and say, you know, where are we going? What battle are we fighting? Here's, and, here's, and here's what happens. And we're going to take a break here. We have a little contest. But, uh, but ah. I want you to address this when we come back. Sure. What happens when you work with a situation that's ex- extremely, if you will, top-down oriented? Mm-hmm. All right. Correct. When, when leaders change and when uh, administrations change, the people who are actually on the ground doing the work are afraid to take risks. They, 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 they want to wait until they're told, here's, here's what the dip because the Correct. military folks Correct. Here, here's the plan of attack here's what we're going to do when the plan changes every six months three months people step back and are hesitant to do anything correct and so and so decisions don't get made people don't get served correct and people get sick and die correct all right so we're going to talk about that when we come okay. back so go ahead Jeff. that's right it's time to give away some free free stuff we got free coffee free toast and of course jams and spreads Yum. for that toast delicious yes okay here's what you got to do during this next commercial break Give us a call. That's it. No questions. No quiz. Just free coffee. 721-1290 is the number. 721-1290. And you can pick up your free coffee at the Garden City Garden Supply across from the Eastgate Shopping Center on Rocket coffee, North baby. Missoula. All right. First All right, call. We got our calls. The first caller, 721-1290. We are so easy. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming right back. And congratulations to Robin, who was our winner just a minute ago in the uh, Rocket Coffee Contest. We appreciate her calling in. Uh, 721-1290, we're talking with Chris Poloimus, who's joining us uh, this morning. He's a veteran, uh, works for the Veterans Administration. Now, we've been talking about what's I been going on. I work as a volunteer. As a volunteer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you were talking right before the break about the top-down management, and that's right. really hitting Missoula and potentially hitting Missoula pretty hard here in the near future because we've we're trying to decide what to do with our current VA clinic here, which is, I believe, at capacity. Correct. And the Washington, D.C. is telling us that we need to do something that uh, may not be the best for vets. I was hoping that uh, Mr. Poloinus could go into that for us. So what happened, there's a forestry building down on Pine near Higgins. And the forestry had to get out of there because it was costing them too much money for rent lease. So the government finds an empty building and they say, okay, well, let's go there without looking at all of the parameters, you know, that are involved. Do you have any idea how many empty office buildings there are in Missoula right now? There are hundreds. But but not not that are owned by the government. Yeah, there you go. So if they're owned by the government and they're on top of that mountain I'm looking at... (laughs) They'll say, move it up there. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the, uh, the, 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 there was a forestry 
the Forestry Service was there, right? Why did Correct. they Why did they move out? Like I was saying, because it was costing them way too much money. On top of that, there was no parking, and that's the big issue. But Washington is saying, well, we have a government building. We're going to have to occupy it. So what's happening here at our Seabock, uh, our clinic here, is we have so many providers that are standing in hallways doing their jobs because there's no available mm. space to work, you know. And for some reason, Washington, D.C. is just adamant on trying to make that work. But how are you going to change old downtown? Yeah. You know? Well, I, I got to ask you, what do you think is a possible solution? Um, obviously, if foresters, rugged foresters can't make it to the office, it's going to be hard for vets that sometimes are in wheelchairs, uh, sometimes have disabilities that make it even more difficult to find parking, that sort of thing, to get to the clinic to get help. So what do you think is a reasonable solution given the certain certain circumstances here in Missouri. The solution has been on the table right next to the clinic. There's another building that's empty. It's been ready to be moved in and that would house and we have plenty of parking down there, but it's not government owned. Okay, now, for, for those who are ignorant, tell us where the current building is located. The current building is uh, located on on Palmer Street, right w within the state building offices. Sure, yeah, and so and so there are vacant buildings throughout that. that that's right a, next door. Yeah, that's a huge complex, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, and I I've been there with my brother, and uh, and and I've seen and the people there. I mean, they're great people who 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 work there, and and they do the best they can with the the facilities that they have. They're amazing people, and the younger set that have just come out of our recent wars, you know, are doing fantastic jobs. Our nurses, our doctors are doing everything they can. But when they don't have the ample space and they can't provide the services that are much needed to our veterans, our combat veterans, then what are we doing? Allow me to ask you this. Uh, if if, the, if they are uh, uh, the, in the facility they're in right now, uh, why is the government allowing them to stay there? And, 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 and if they're already in that building, why not simply expand and continue to use the building that they have? I, I, I guess I don't understand the mindset as to, as to why this whole thing has to be so difficult. Well, nobody understands that mindset. <laughs> <laughs> you know, out of sight, out of mind. They're way far away. Yeah, yeah. Now, what did did Mr. McDonald? <laughs> did did Robert McDonald? He, I was here. I met him. Mm -hmm. A pretty nice guy. When he was here, did he he actually went to the clinic? Right. He actually went to the clinic. And, and I did, talked with him and shook his hand. And, 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 and did did he see the the space next he door? He saw the space and the problems that are existing. What was his reaction? I don't know. He okay. didn't tell me. Okay. Right. <laughs> but I, I believe that he is a very determined and conscientious person, but he has a, a stomach problem. He's got 300 different, you right. know, clinics and, and outposts throughout the United States. Sure. We only have 1,300 veterans we serve here in Montana. You know, is this going to be his priority? How do we make that a priority? That comes from our elected officials, if they can, you know, understand that we do have more veterans, more combat veterans in the state of Montana than any other state. So why aren't we treating them yeah. the way So so that's that's where that's where Danes, Tester and Zinke come in, right? Yep. And and I know Dane Danes and Zinke are both new in the office, but Tester's been there for a while. He actually showed up with McDonald yep. and uh, uh, was introducing him around that sort yep. of thing. So um it, so is he kind of the point man on this deal or what? Who's that? Uh, John Tester. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He was there. If only we he had video. There. <laughs> he was there. Is he point man? If he is point man, yeah, yeah. and they can call in and say he is point man, that's great. Well, let's then it, we can get on him. Well, let's put it this way. Nobody in the last 10 years has, has uh, campaigned so vigorously on being a, uh, a, a promoter of veterans affairs than John Tester. Correct. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll leave that for a second. We have a one minute break. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I wanted before we go to the break next uh, next Thursday, I believe May thirtieth. There's the Heroes at Home uh, barbecue. May thirtieth. I'm right. sorry, May thirtieth. Right. That's a whole month away. Yes, but it is coming up. And one of the things you wanted to do is you're looking for a good singer to sing the national anthem, right? We certainly are. It's going to be an all day affair. We're expecting uh, hopefully around 1,200 veterans there. Maybe, you know, more veterans than we've ever seen in, in Missoula. It's going to be an all-day affair, free food from 12 to 3, 
great bands, great service providers. So if you've got a beautiful voice and want to bring a tear to a, the eyes of a bunch Please of vets. Please call me at 214-0333. Peter, put that phone down. Uh, <laughs> and you repeat that number. That phone number down. <laughs> 406-214-0333. Yeah, we're going to come right back after this one-minute timeout. Stay with us. Just in case you think uh, nobody listens to this show. <laughs> you're, you're, Don't hear what I said. Your phone is going crazy. Our phone is going crazy. Uh, 721-1290. Now, now, we have this event coming up, and you say you have a, a needs of a lot of stuff that, that, we can, that you need for your picnic, right? Yeah, what we really need is we need, number one, a great singer for the national anthem. That would be fantastic. We also need, you know, maybe up to 30 watermelons for everybody. We would like to also any vendors that are out there that want to supply food prior to the 12, 3 o'clock free food time to give us a call. Cool. And also call the vet center, uh, Brian Becker. Oh, yeah. and, Brian's uh, a good guy. Yeah, yeah. and uh, have him field a lot of these calls. <laughs> I don't know if my little phone will take all this. <laughs> it's beginning to smoke right yeah. there. Anyway, <laughs> anyway seven seven two one twelve ninety oh, is, is the number one eight hundred five six eight five three zero nine. And and uh, th- th- this is go ahead, John. Well, that worked. Uh, yeah. Jim Adair just called in. He says put put him down for a grand for helping out with the event. Is that right? That's right. Fantastic. Ex-marine, Fantastic. Ex marine, just like you. Yeah. Actually, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine, is Nope. There? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why people come up with he, that. He, he's a Marine veteran. He's a Marine. Yeah. Because my, my dad... No, I'm just a Marine. My, my, my dad was a lieutenant colonel. Ah. My mom was a DI sergeant. And you... And I'm 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 a schmuck. <laughs> I, I well, did you not, had one heck of a growing I, up. I, I, you ought to see me make a bed, baby. I, <laughs> I, I, like nobody's business. Anyway. So flip we, a quarter on it. We yeah. are running out of time. I would like to get uh, some final words from sure. you. What do you what What can the public do to get involved and help make sure that Missoula is a good place to be a vet? Say that one more time. because What can the that. public do to help make sure that Missoula is a good place to be a vet? How do we get involved? How do we make sure the VA doesn't end up throwing you guys in a place where you can't get to the office? <laughs> uh, what, what, what can we do? Two things. Concentrate on our public officials and the problems that are at hand in our clinic here so that we can have better, you know, facilities to help, you know, all of our brothers and sisters. Uh, number two, come to the event that we're uh, putting on May 30th. It's going to be, it's going to be encompassed with every veteran organization and nonprofit organization that works for veterans. Come, get involved, see what we're doing, and like I've said before, the younger, the younger veterans are really getting involved, and we really have to get behind them, and give them a push, and know that they're welcomed home that they're valuable, and we care about them. Mm. Wow. Powerful stuff. All right. Now, we have exactly three minutes before three we're done here. Minutes. Yeah, three minutes. Right. Three so whole So did you want to talk about the forestry up there? No, yeah. We, are, we, we, we kind of we covered it a little bit. Right. Um, did you get any – have you heard anything back after showing in the building? Or is there is – there, are you going to go through the state, through Helena for that? Or for getting the, uh, the ability to buy that – office space that's right next to the current location well that's way above my pay grade or a pay grade i'd ever be in and since you're a volunteer that's not well well, here here, (laughs) well they they give me a lot of access here is here is something that may help all right i have tried to call the veterans administration in helena through fort harrison i can't tell you how many times as a newsman as a journalist all right i have never never once gotten a call back I have had a very different experience. Really? Yeah. In the last two years, I think I've tried to call for veteran stories two or three times, and every time I've called, I've gotten a call back. Seriously. Call the public information officer. I have. Uh, well, he, He's the one that wouldn't call me back. No, I, I uh. never call the public. <laughs> uh. I call the, actually call the clinic in Helena, yeah. and uh, they usually, the, you know, the operator puts me through to somebody, okay. and eventually I get word back. Well, then... 
You're a better man than I am. Uh, these public I'll information officers for many organizations are a joke. <laughs> their job is to make sure nobody ever talks to you, <laughs> and to make sure that their you know their precious little crystal of information mm. is protected from any outside influence. That could be, but I think that you people that are in the air all of the time don't just need to do this half hour spot, but do it every other day. Do it enough times to where they're going to say. Whoa, there you know there's too much information. We've got to talk to them. Mm, mm. That's the way that works. All Put right. So on. so so we have to have a if you will a little bit of a blitzkrieg. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean if you want anything done, either yeah. that or you know nothing ever gets done. It's the we'll Peter John and Chris show every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last half hour of every program is dedicated to. Yeah, anyway. But So listen. I want to say one thing. Anybody calling in right. for the uh, Joint Community Forces uh, May 30th picnic wants to donate whatever. Call me or call Brian Becker at the Vet Center. And we appreciate any donations. We really need a lot of help to pull this thing off. Give us, give us your phone number one more time. Okay, my phone number uh, is 406-214-0333. All right. All right. Do you happen to know the Vet Center number? Not offhand. Uh, okay. Well, there phones. you go. That, that's but a, you can find that out pretty <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's live radio. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, Chris, thanks for thanks for stopping by, yeah. and thanks for your service to our country. Man. Thank you. God bless you. All right. All right. So, all right, uh, what's coming up on tomorrow's fabulous radio show? Well, Mr. tentatively open phones, but I got an email from Ryan Zinke this morning, and he might join us for a little well, bit tomorrow. Well, I'm not sure if we have uh, room for the uh, congressman to be on the radio tomorrow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the gun show is that one. <laughs> but I, w- I will say that we do have Catching the Big Ones, remember, from 8 to 9, and then uh, it's one hour of talk back from 9 to 10. So thanks for joining us, and again, uh, thank you so much, sir, and uh, – um, thanks to Bob Seidenschwartz of the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. We had a great time with that, and we will have another edition of Talk Back tomorrow at 9 after catching the big one.